How do we know what we know about God, ourselves, and the world? And what is the relationship between God, ourselves, and the world? And if we do come to know some true answers to those questions, is it even possible to explain them to anyone else or persuade them of the truth? Bound up in this series of questions are matters which philosophers and theologians call epistemology, how we know what we know, ontology, what things actually are, and apologetics, how we defend our Christian faith. These three categories can be distinguished, but they really do overlap in various ways. How we know certain things depends to some extent on the kind of thing that it is. We can know to varying degrees about the sun, cats, New York City, our own thoughts and intentions, God, angels, and math, and lots of other things too. And of course, there's lots that we know little or nothing about, like a little rock happily whizzing around in some distant galaxy. If I'm defending my belief or knowledge that there is a cat in the driveway, I may describe the physical characteristics of the cat, his coloring, shape, size. I may refer to history. It's the same cat we've seen in the neighborhood previously. I might also argue that it isn't a dog or a raccoon. I might also appeal to my own reliability. I've been known to tell the truth. Or I might appeal to other witnesses, other people who saw the cat. Now change the subject. What if I'm defending my belief or knowledge that there is an angel in the driveway? I could walk through the same defenses, but something has changed. What is it? The nature of the thing has changed. Also, your experiences with angels is probably a lot more limited than it is with cats. Fewer experiences seem to suggest that the claim is less likely. But then again, maybe you've never been to New York City, never experienced it for yourself, but you've heard a lot of testimony about it from witnesses, and so you have no problem believing that New York City exists. So we use things like experience, testimony or witnesses, reliability of different kinds of evidence, and basic logic to decide whether we believe what we have seen or heard. At the bottom of all of these considerations are what philosophers call presuppositions, basic assumptions that everyone makes about the nature of truth, language, logic, and ultimately, where it all comes from. With regard to apologetics, defending the Christian faith, Presuppositionalism was popularized by Cornelius Van Til, professor of apologetics for many years at Westminster Theological Seminary. Van Til's work has been further popularized, explained, and at points corrected or improved in recent decades by men like Greg Bonson and John Frame. Like many prolific writers and teachers, Professor Van Til wrote mountains of material and, as a human being made in the image of God, there are no doubt things he got wrong to varying degrees and things he got right to varying degrees. But one of his great gifts to the Christian church was robust Christian presuppositionalism. Sometimes people even call it Vantillianism. Presuppositionalism consists of two foundational claims. The first is that everything in the universe is contingent or dependent on God, and this includes our thinking about anything in the universe. In him we live and move and have our being. All things are upheld by the power of his word. And all things includes every thought bubble that ever popped up in any human mind. God holds everything together, all the time. This is an ontological claim, that is what everything is, but precisely for that reason it is also an epistemological and apologetic claim as well. We can't know anything or persuade anyone else to know anything apart from the triune God holding that together. And in our thinking about the truth and persuading others to believe the truth, we are either seeking to acknowledge that fact or else we are trying to suppress it. And that's the second claim of presuppositionalism. Unbelievers are not happy about the fact that God holds everything together. Natural fallen man resents God, hates God, and suppresses the truth about God in unrighteousness. In regeneration, God has planted the seed of the gospel in the heart of an individual which expresses itself in faith, gratitude, and love for God and his truth, particularly as it is found in his word in the Bible. Presuppositions are assumptions, things we take for granted, foundational truths that we believe, often without thinking about them or examining them. A presupposition would be the fact that you probably assumed 
that the cat I was describing in the driveway earlier was on all fours on the ground. You probably weren't tempted to wonder if the cat was floating in midair doing the backstroke. Why? Because you presupposed gravity and other ordinary things about cats. Some of our basic human presuppositions are bound up with the use of our senses, reason, logic, and language. Every human being is constantly assuming that their senses are generally telling them the truth, that what they are seeing, hearing, smelling, touching, and tasting is real. This is related to some basic building blocks of reason and logic, like the laws of identity and non-contradiction. The law of identity means that things are what they are. Everything has a fixed nature. A dog must be a dog, and it cannot also be at the same time a cat. The law of non-contradiction says that a dog cannot be a dog and not a dog at the same time. These basic presuppositions allow us to speak about things truthfully and to assume that when something changes or moves or surprises us, it either had some other property or characteristic we didn't know about, or something acted upon it. So, if a little minnow turned into a frog, either a wizard muttered an incantation and caused it to happen, or else that wasn't really a minnow. It was a tadpole. If you left a baseball in the front yard and you come home and it's on the front porch, you probably don't immediately assume that baseballs can fly. You use presuppositions to assume that someone or something moved it. This is because of your sensory experiences with baseballs and your reasoning and logic skills. And don't miss the fact that while I'm talking, you're able to understand roughly what I'm talking about. Language communicates. Language is a basic building block or presupposition of life. If you're not a philosopher or a theologian, most people go through life thinking very little about these presuppositions, unless you're taking a class in school or watching a Reformed Basics video or something. But people still might wonder, where did these basic building blocks of thinking and communicating and living come from? Where did we get these tools? The Christian answer is God. The non-Christian answer is some variation on chance. The Christian says we were created in the image of God and he gave us these gifts so that we might know him and praise him and love him and serve and love one another and enjoy all that God has made. The non-Christian says there was a big bang that we evolved from pond scum and these tools developed through random mutation and survival of the fittest. The Christian says, since these tools and all things are gifts, we should give God thanks. The non-Christian says, since these tools and all things were a random accident, we got really lucky. However, the Bible teaches that the non-Christian is not telling the truth. The non-Christian is not merely mistaken, the non-Christian is lying. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. Romans 1, 18-22 Because people have sinned, they know they are under God's wrath. Therefore, they naturally and willfully suppress the truth. They're like Adam and Eve. They know they are naked and ashamed, and they try to hide in the bushes. The whole creation says that there is a God, and that he created all things, so they are without excuse. But they don't want to admit that there is a God, or at least not a personal God, a God who cares about people and all things, the God of the Bible, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus. Some unbelievers will give lip service to the idea of some distant, impersonal God, but they suppress the truth about the triune God because they are not on good terms with the triune God. They have sinned and are guilty, and they are hiding in the bushes. What makes it worse is that every sinner is running around in this world, enjoying the gifts of God all day long, and at the same time, suppressing the truth of God all day long. It's like Christmas every day, and the unbeliever fundamentally denies that anyone gave the gifts or filled the stockings. It would be like having a fancy sports car, 
and assuming that it was just a random, lucky thing. Your body, your senses, your ability to think and reason and communicate are all fancy sports cars. You are either constantly giving thanks to the one who gave you all those gifts, or you are lying and pretending you don't know where they came from and suppressing the truth in unrighteousness. In other words, living and thinking in this world is necessarily ethical and moral in nature. There is no neutrality. There is always an antithesis. You can't breathe or think or do a math problem or hit a baseball or drive a car in a morally neutral way. You are either giving thanks to God or not. You are either using and enjoying those gifts under God's blessing on good terms with the one who gave them, or else you're trespassing in God's world. You're a thief, constantly breaking and entering into God's world, using his gifts without permission, without thanking him, under his wrath. This is the most basic presupposition, either acknowledging and thanking God, or else suppressing and resenting God. So take your apologetics into the throne room of God on the last day. Will anyone have any legitimate excuses? The Bible says that every mouth will be shut, every knee will bow, and every mouth will confess that they always knew deep down that Jesus Christ was Lord. No one will be able to honestly say they didn't know. In other words, hell will be entirely just. Not all Christians are convinced that presuppositionalism is helpful. For example, some Christians ask, how can someone examine a presupposition if it is truly a presupposition, that is, an assumption that is pre-conscious? Our answer is the same as the one Scripture gives to us regarding the examination of our hearts and thoughts. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Jeremiah 17, 9. Counsel in the heart of man is like deep water, but a man of understanding will draw it out. Proverbs 20, verse 5. So natural sinful man can barely know his own heart, and only a man of understanding can carefully draw out his own thoughts and intentions. How does a man get understanding in order to do that? For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Hebrews 4.12 we need the Word of God to search our hearts. So it's true that it can be terribly difficult to examine our presuppositions, and that's why we need God and His Word to give us light. Another question some Christians ask is how it is possible for a finite human being to truly think of God before the act of thinking itself. These Christians agree that God is truly prior to any thoughts we might have ontologically, but they would say that finite human beings have to start thinking and reasoning with themselves, and then work their way out toward God. But the Bible teaches very clearly that the beginning of knowledge is the fear of the Lord, Proverbs 1.7. While it is true that the mind is the primary tool for knowing, the Bible teaches that there is more to it than that. Some also accuse presuppositionalists of circular reasoning. We insist that people must presuppose God and his word in the Bible in order to think and reason well, so the question sometimes comes, but why would you say that? And our cheerful reply is, because God said so. And they say, but that's circular reasoning. You're defending your claim with your claim. That's not good reasoning. But there are at least two answers to this. The first is that when it comes to whether there is a God or not, everyone must finally resort to a kind of circular reasoning. You can only dig so deep with human minds. No one has seen God at any time. God cannot be demonstrated like a science experiment, combining baking soda and vinegar. So everyone finally presupposes that God exists or assumes he does not. Why? Either because he says he exists or because they say he hasn't. Because they believe him or they don't. But our second response to the accusation of circular reasoning is that there are more or less vicious circles of reasoning. The Bible does not at all condemn testimony, evidence, signs, or the use of reason and logic. Rather, the Bible is full of such things, assuming that rational creatures will need them to arrive at the truth. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. John 20, verses 30 and 31. Presupposing God and the Bible 
is not a vicious circle of reasoning because there really is good evidence for the truth of God and his word. Creation, the consistency and truthfulness of scripture, miracles testified by many witnesses, the resurrection of Jesus from the dead, also witnessed by hundreds, the experience of forgiveness and the presence of the spirit. And we can add to all those evidences the testimonies of countless millions of Christians over the last 2,000 years, the success of the gospel filling the earth and transforming families and nations, as well as archeological and historical evidence that corroborates the testimony of scripture. But these reasons do not finally add up to conclusive proof. And this is why we must ultimately decide to trust God or not. And this leads to a final question or objection. Is presuppositionalism a form of fideism? Fideism is the idea that faith is independent of reason, or that faith and reason are at odds, or that faith is far superior to reason. But the biblical vision of faith is none of these things. The biblical vision of faith is actually something like a heightened ability to reason. Faith is reason on fire. Faith is reason guided by the Holy Spirit. The problem is that some have spoken about faith and reason as though reason is something that natural man can do on his own without God, and faith is purely a supernatural skyhook that mystically connects us to God without any logic or evidence. But the Bible doesn't speak in either one of those ways. Remember what John said in his gospel. He doesn't assume that people will just get zapped with faith and be regenerated and believe in Christ. He assumes that people need evidence and testimony to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. This is why the Bible was written, so that people might read it, examine its claims, and having considered the reasons for believing, come to faith in Jesus. At the same time, the Bible also teaches that the ability to reason, consider evidence, and ultimately believe in Jesus are all gifts from God. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. Natural man cannot come to faith in Jesus and then pat himself on the back for being such a thoughtful, reasonable fellow. The Bible describes a sort of basic ability to think and reason common to all men as part of the image of God. Presuppositionalism doesn't teach that unregenerate men cannot know anything. Presuppositionalism teaches that unregenerate men cannot account for their knowledge consistently. They can report what they see with their eyes, but they cannot account for why they have eyes or why they work, except for thanking their lucky stars, which, come to think of it, isn't really a good reason. The Bible also describes the effects of sin as distorting that ability to think clearly in varying degrees. When you are determined to ignore the biggest elephant in the room, God, you really must make some enormous leaps of faith and logic. If anyone is a fideist, it's unbelievers. You can't reject God and remain wise or intelligent very long. But it isn't like a light switch. Or if it is like a light switch, it's like those enormous stadium lights. After you turn them off, they glow and are warm for a while before going completely black. Men and women and cultures can officially reject God and refuse to give him thanks and they can still glow with intelligence and warm morality for a little while. But eventually, they will go cold and dark. Eventually, they'll begin saying crazy things like, boys can be girls and girls can be boys. Knowledge is entirely a gift from God. When we acknowledge that and give God thanks, we are making God and his word our presupposition. As it turns out, in order for us to do that, God must begin that work in us. He teaches our hearts to fear him, and we in turn begin to know him and all things. There is a remnant of that good fear in all human beings since they are made in God's image, but it is doomed to fading darkness if the Holy Spirit does not regenerate us so that we might love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. When we share the gospel or seek to persuade unbelievers of the truth, we are free to point to every form of evidence, scripture, creation, regeneration, miracles, and archeology, span but we can't ever forget that they are driving stolen vehicles. Their ability to think and reason and consider the evidence is itself the gift of the God they are currently rejecting. And there is some fundamental level on which they know that is what they are doing. The bottom line is that they must humble themselves and admit that. 
The real obstacle to faith in Christ is not sufficient evidence or good reasons. The real obstacle is pride. But many a hard heart of pride has been cut down by the sharp grace of Christ crucified. And that is our fundamental presupposition. Christ is all. One, what is epistemology? Epistemology is the study of knowledge, seeking to account for how we know what we know. Two, what is ontology? Ontology is the study of things, trying to understand what things are in themselves and how different kinds of things are related to one another. Three, what is apologetics? Apologetics is the study and activity of defending the Christian faith. Four, what is presuppositionalism? Presuppositionalism is an apologetic method based on the two foundational claims that everything in the universe is dependent on God and people are obligated to acknowledge that. Five, what is a presupposition? A presupposition is a basic assumption about the nature of reality and where everything came from that people often don't even think about. Six, what are some of the basic presuppositions most people live with? Some basic presuppositions would be the reliability of our senses, reason, logic, experience, and language. 7. What are two of the most basic concepts of logic that most people constantly assume? Define them both. The two most basic concepts of logic are the law of identity and the law of non-contradiction. The law of identity simply means that everything is what it is. There is something there that has a particular fixed nature that we can speak about or point to. The law of non-contradiction means that something cannot be itself and its opposite in the same way at the same time. 8. What does it mean to say that there is no neutrality or that there is always an antithesis? We mean that every human thought or action is loaded with moral and ethical meaning. Every human thought or action is either pleasing to God or at war with God. 9. What does presuppositionalism insist on with regard to the final judgment? Presuppositionalism insists that no one will be without excuse at the final judgment. No one will be able to say that they honestly didn't know. Hell will be entirely just. 10. Is presuppositionalism circular? Presuppositionalism is only circular insofar as every fundamental claim about God must ultimately come back to whether we believe God or not. This is not a vicious circle, since presuppositionalism does not deny the rightful role of evidence, testimony, or reason. 11. Is presuppositionalism a form of fideism? Why not? No, presuppositionalism is not a form of fideism because it does not set faith and reason against one another, nor does it privilege faith over reason. Rather, presuppositionalism asserts that faith actually is a spirit-guided reason, or reason redeemed. But this really is a gift from God and not something natural man can use on his own to find God. 12. When seeking to persuade unbelievers of the truth of the gospel, what tools may we use? But what do they fundamentally need? We are free to use the tools of reason, experience, scripture, or archaeology. But unbelievers must ultimately repent of their lying and pride, seeking to be wise and understand apart from God. Unbelievers need to be humbled by the cross of Christ and make God and His Word their first and primary presupposition.